and say our confession. Father, you said that when we mix faith with the word preached, miracles happen. Miracles happen. We fully expect, we fully expect miracles, to place miracles to take place today. today. Father, I thank you that your anointing flows unhindered. I thank you for revelation knowledge flowing unhindered. I thank you for your presence in this place. And everyone who enters here will have an encounter with you that will forever change them. Amen. You may be seated. God is good. Come on. I'm excited. We're wrapping up today um, on the covenant. So if you haven't been here and haven't heard it, you can go online and listen to the ones we've already done. But remember, the covenant is a shedding of blood. It's the cutting and the shedding of blood. We have an old covenant and a new covenant. We have an old shedding of blood and a new shedding of blood. So we have what God, the blessings that God produced in the old covenant when we were obedient to the law are still in effect today. But then when he made a covenant with Abraham, he just added more on top of it. Come on, that's exciting. See, God don't take things away from us, blessings away from us. He keeps adding more to it. And we learned that through that, we were free. Amen? That when Jesus died on the cross, that we were redeemed from the curse of poverty, from sickness, and from spiritual death. That we were not counted as righteous. We were made righteous. Amen? And the blood of Jesus cleansed us, made us righteous. It freed us. Jesus took poverty so that we would be made rich. He took our sickness so that we would be healed. Amen. And those are things we get to walk in. And remember, when the blessings don't flow in your life, what does the Bible say? My people perish for a lack of knowledge. It means that we don't understand that they're ours, number one, or we don't even understand how to appropriate them. And so we talked last week about how that we have to have an attitude. That attitude is everything. And there's a covenant attitude that a, a, a child of God should have. I don't know about you, but we ought to have an attitude that when the enemy comes to steal something that belongs to us. I told one girl, I said, didn't you grow up on Tybee? And she said, yes. I said, I know you got in a lot of fights growing up. She said, yes. Yeah. I said, then why don't you apply that same principle to the enemy? Stand up and fight. For some reason, we've got this idea in our head that we need to be meek. Well, meek doesn't mean putting up with everything that comes your way with a smile on your face. When the Bible says to be meek, you know what they were thinking of? A horse that was in the middle of battle. He was trained. He was ready to go. And that horse forged forward in battle no matter how many arrows were thrown his way. No matter how many times he got hit, he kept on going. That's the kind of attitude we're supposed to have. No matter what happens to us in life, no matter how many of the, enemy, the darts the enemy throws at us, we need to stand up and keep on going. Come on, who, are, who do we belong to? God. We're his kid. And, you know, I want you to think about this. When someone's pregnant and people are expecting their baby, I know I've, had, I've got two daughter-in-laws, and I hear both of them, they both were, have them babe boys, and all I'm, all, I want them to look just like their daddy. Well, you know, when God created us, he created us in their image, in his image. Because he wanted us to be just like him. Come on, we're not below that. Remember that God's put us even above the angels. Come on, he said, the angels are standing there looking, God, what is man that you are so mindful of him? Why are you so concerned about this creation that you're creating here? Because we're supposed to live like him. We're supposed to think like him. He said, you're supposed to have heaven on earth. We're not supposed to wait till we get there for things to be wonderful. We're supposed to have joy here on this earth. And we talked about how that the word of God is the only thing that can divide the good from the bad that's on, in the inside of us. And as we study his word and as we read his word, it's like a sword that goes in and it cuts away all the things that God doesn't like inside of us. It cuts away our pride to thinking I can do this thing on my own. It cuts away rejection. It cuts away unforgiveness. And the Bible tells us that we are to have the mind of Christ. Well, he's not going to tell us that if it's not available for us. 
And remember, the Bible says, my ways are higher than yours. My thoughts are higher than yours. And religion wants to tell us we'll never be able to think like God. Yes, we can because he's written it in his word. All his thoughts, all his ways, all his will is written in the word of God. And I love the fact that God thought it up of me that he wrote it down for me. Every promise, every blessing he wanted me to walk in is all right there in his word just for me. And I love that. <clears throat> and we're to pray this, Psalm 139. Verse 23 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me on the path of everlasting life. I love that. And remember we talked about last time, I think somebody was sabotaging me, this top wasn't on. Um, it says, lay, lay your viewpoint. Remember, anytime you face a situation, anytime anything comes to you, there's two viewpoints. There's God's viewpoint and there's man's viewpoint. Now, I've had to watch that growing up. Watching my parents pastor a church, she would, they would make decisions and they'd put people in position or they would do this or they would do that or somebody would leave the church and they wouldn't pursue after them. And, and the natural man is thinking, you need to do this and you need to do that and that person's more qualified and that person's this. But it's not our thinking, it's God's thinking. Because God knows things that we don't know. God either knows the price that person has paid in the private that nobody else knows. They know the decisions they've made in private or the things they've given up that nobody else knows. He knows what's on the heart, whether there's a, an attitude in there that one day may hurt the church that we don't even know is there because they put on a good front. But God knows all things. And now that I'm pastor, I've learned, hey, now I know what she's done all that time when I didn't understand. But the thing was, I knew enough about her prayer life and I knew about her, enough about her walk with God that I trusted her even when I didn't understand. And see, that's the thing. You've got to learn to trust God even if you don't understand. And you've got to just lay it down and let him do what he wants to do. Amen? So what does an attitude look like for a person whose life is in God? For a, a man or a woman who understands their covenant, who understands what God's given us, what is that attitude? Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is worldliness. Now, automatically, when I say that word, you think of all the things the world do that w does that we call sin. But see, God doesn't look at worldliness just at what we do. He looks at it as what we think, too and what our attitude is, and what our heart is. Worldliness is not just whether you drink or don't drink, or whether you go, go to the, you know, the club or you don't go to the club, but all that stuff. God, that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about much more than that. You know, a lot of times we can pretend and play church and act like, we're, we're, act like we are not worldly, but God knows our heart. He knows our attitudes. He knows our thoughts. Romans 12, verse 1 says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I love that. Change the way you think. Now, whenever there's a position or a situation put in front of me, I need to run to God and say, God, what is your opinion of this? What do you think about this? He said, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know, it's kind of like those that come to church. You're here, but you're not here. Man, you get into praise and worship. That's fun. You get into praise and worship. You sing. You dance. But the minute the person gets up there to preach the word, you're jotting down the things that you need to do on Monday when you get to work. Or you're flipping through your phone, looking at Facebook. So you're here, but you're not here. And let me tell you, there's a difference. You can't fully receive all that's coming from the throne room of God if you're preoccupied with other things. That's why we tell people, I don't care if you're in the video room, I don't care if you're back there, when you're on duty, you are not free to receive all that God wants for you. That's why we want you to serve one and attend one, because you need to give God his un your undivided attention. Amen? So you can receive all that he has for you. You know, people become a master of disguise, and being, 
in God and being with God is not something that we turn on a switch on Sunday morning at 845. And we turn it off at 1 o'clock when we leave the sanctuary. It's not a Sunday morning religion. Come on, it's an everyday walk with God. It's an everyday communion with Him. It's an everyday relationship that we have with Him. And every time I get in the Word, He changes me more and more and more. Amen? So worldliness is an attitude. It's a way of life. It's what we do. We worship Him. We praise Him. We meditate on it day and night. And when we preach on Sunday, when you hear the Word on Sunday, it ought to be a confirmation of what you've been spending time with Him all week long. It should be fresh and new. It ought to be confirmation. I mean, I get excited when you say, hey, that's what I've been reading all week long in the Bible. Because it's a confirmation that you're on the right track. Amen? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not of the things on earth. Remember I said last week when we saw that Revivus 2, the Kendrick brothers were talking about just things the world's all consumed with right now. And he said when you're sitting in your home and you're consumed with those things and that's all you talk about, he said pretty soon you elevate that thing above the Word of God. And those worldly things and the situations in the world and all that you're trying to solve in the world should not be the top, number one topic that you discuss. The number one topic in your home, the number one to topic around you ought to be the Word of God and His solutions and not what the world's going on. Amen? Because you know that the more you talk about the situation, the more stuff builds up inside of you. And I don't like anything that's going to distract me from being in His throne room and hearing His voice clearly. But when I got a stinking attitude, I can't hear Him as well. Amen? So you've got to be available for Him. The second thing that as a child of God, though, that know their covenant, you ought to have peace. Peace ought to rule in your heart. Amen? Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose what? Thoughts are fixed on you. Philippians 4, 7 says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. The third thing is there ought to be stability in your life. The least little wind that comes along shouldn't knock you off track. The least little situation in your life shouldn't knock you off track. The first time you don't get your prayer answered the way you thought it ought to be answered shouldn't shake you enough that you don't come back to church. You ought to be stable in your ways. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 says, Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a significant a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Man, I'm telling you, the end-time people that preach doom and gloom and despair, that's not God. Those of us who believe that he's coming soon, it ought to be an exciting time for you. It ought to be, shouldn't be a time of fear and trembling. It ought to be a time as, man, I better get to work because I got people I want to snatch out of hell and I want them to go to heaven and I got to be about the master's business and I don't have time to worry about what anybody thinks. Come on, we got to be ready for the end time harvest, amen? So we're not shaken in spirit because we've got to remember the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of us. And the problem is that when we get shaken, we got the thoughts come in our head, it shakes us up, it makes the spirit ineffective. Come on, think about it. When you let your thought life rule the way your attitude is, when you let the thoughts that come in put fear in you, put despair in you, Put all anything in you that's not him, it makes the spirit man ineffective because you've got that screaming a lot louder than the Holy Spirit inside of you is. I, I want to shut that noise up. Amen. Amen? And I want the Spirit of God to be able to rise up inside of me. That's why we tell you to read your word. 
That's why the Bible tells you to meditate it on, on it day and night. Because the minute that thought comes in your head, the minute you hear something that's contrary to what God's word says, your first response isn't, oh my. Or, oh my God, I got to call somebody. Your first response is, El no demon, no way are you going to do this. Your first response is, no, the word of God says, and you start quoting the word. You don't let him rule. You don't let him reign. Amen? amen. Come on, I should have had a bigger amen than that. Amen. Tell the devil, no, you're not putting that inside of me. Hallelujah. Y'all got to get bold with him. Amen? Amen. The fourth one is love. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Your strength is manifested in your love for God. 1 Corinthians 13 is love in action. It first starts with an attitude of the heart, and then action always follows it. When you're stable and when peace rules and when your mind is stayed on the things of God, when you think his thoughts, when you have his viewpoint, when you walk in love, you will have strength to fight the enemy. Amen? Come on. That's where your strength comes from. That's where your ability comes from to not be shaken. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 says, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts, and we teach them to obey Christ. Listen, the source of every problem in the world today is Satan. Come on. The source of every problem in the world today is Satan. We don't attack flesh. We attack spirit. Amen? We, when we go into battle, we tear down walls around what we want victory in. The walls of human reasoning. You can't understand God with your mind. We can't understand him intellectually. Now, I love these people that want to try to understand it all intellectually and speak intellectually. That's fine and good. But, folks, the gospel is simple. You don't need to try to complicate it with your human reasoning. It is simple. He shed his blood, died on a cross, paid for our sins, was raised from the dead so that we could be made whole. Come on, I love it. Salvation means everything, spirit, soul, and body. All of it gets redeemed. Amen? means we're saved, healed, and delivered. Hallelujah. He did it all. So we've got to understand, we've got to take that. We tear down our pride and understand we can't do it on our own. We're soldiers. When Paul talks about it, he always thinks that, you've got to think about it. Most of the time, Paul's in prison as he's writing these. And he's watching the Roman soldiers as he's pinning a lot of this stuff. He watches the way they do things, and he applies it to the Christian walk. You know, I, I tease mom because one of her favorite songs is, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. You've got to think about it that way. I'm a soldier for Christ. Come on. We're, we're battling against spiritual stuff. We, we, we know, and, if, and Paul loved to watch the soldiers come marching back in for a battle. And man, when they had some POWs, when they had some prisoners of war, when they got to conquer the city and bring people back, man, they came back proud. Their shoulders were scared back. They, they had those people coming and marching along with them, and he saw that. And the Bible says that when we act as soldiers of God and we tear down strongholds and we bring them into captivity, you've got to think about all those thoughts that go contrary to the word of God are your POWs. Come on, they're your prisoners of war. And you better take them and parade them in front of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And you lay them down at his feet and you don't take them up any longer. Amen. Come on, we got to bring back those POWs and walk in the victory that God wants us to walk in. Hallelujah. And that's when you say, God, I remember your covenant and I trust in you. And remember last week we read in Isaiah 55 about how that we have to change the way we think and that we can think God's thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. But I love it because he said this happens when you go back up to verse 3, Isaiah 55, verse 3. He said, come to me with your ears wide open. See, when I go to God with a situation or with a problem, I don't need to approach him with the idea of the solution already in my mind. 
It's kind of like when you come to talk to Pastor Dathan and I or Pastor Kempe or any of us on leadership, and you come to us because, and you say to me, I know the Spirit of God is telling me this, then I, I, I'm closed. There's nothing I can say. Because you've already made up your mind that's the will of God. Why should I tell you any otherwise? So then I can't really mentor you or speak into your life. But when you come to me and you say, I feel like the Spirit of God is telling me this, what do you think? So when I go into the throne room of God with a problem, I don't need to go in there with the answer already in my mind. Because it may not be what God wants. So I need to go into the throne room saying, Father, here I am. First of all, make my heart pure. Father, if there's anything in me about this situation that you don't like, clean it up, God. I release all of it to you. I want any bit of my pride, any of my ideas, any of my way of thinking. I want it out of me, God. And I'm open to hear what you have to say about this situation. And then whatever he tells me to do, whether it's repent, whether it's to go to that person and ask them to forgive me, whatever it is, or I have to change the way I view the situation, then I need to let it go. Amen? And so that's all he's saying is here, come to me with your ears wide open, listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, and I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. Now listen to it in the message. He said, pay attention, come close now, listen carefully to my life-giving, life-nourishing word. I'm making a lasting covenant commitment with you, the same that I made with David, sure, solid, enduring love. See, God made a covenant with Abraham, but he also made a covenant with David. And he said, listen, if you come to me, if you throw your pride to the side, if you come to me with open ears, I'm going to give you life-nourishing, life-changing words. He said, and then I'm going to make sure that you walk in this life-sustaining, secure, ever-loving, loving-kindness covenant that I have with you. And it's going to change your viewpoint, amen? God formed a covenant with him. So we're going to find out how David became a man after God's own heart. How many of y'all want to be a person after God's heart? That means, Lord, even if I'm not perfect, you forgive me because I'm going to be quick to repent and make things right. I want to be somebody that you're proud of. I want God to say, hey, I need somebody to do this, and I know Lisa's heart is right. I know that she's going to remain pure before me, so I can give it to her, and the assignment will be done. Amen? So I want to be that kind of person. Now listen, David became the greatest king that Israel ever had. He wasn't the wealthiest by any means. Solomon was. But yet, he was, he was also under the, 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 he was under the reign of the nation of Israel, was the most secure and secure longer than any other king. He is the man that Jesus said he would be an offspring from, the lineage of Jesus. So here we go in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, Samuel was a prophet in the time. Samuel had raised Saul just about his whole life. He had mentored Saul. He was proud of Saul. He saw Saul making some wrong decisions and going away from God, but yet his heart was towards Saul, and he didn't want to see Saul walk away, and he didn't like the idea that God was rejecting Saul, so he was trying to hold on as much as he could. And he was grieving the fact that God was not going to let Saul be the next king. That God was going to take that away from him. And here Samuel is grieving for that. I'm sure he's been in the throne room plenty of times asking God why. Saying, God, can't you just give him another chance? So he, we're seeing that. So Saul, I mean, Saul, okay, I'm going to get it right. Samuel is coming near to the end of his life. He is compromising because he keeps wanting to make Saul the king. And not do what God's told him to do. Now, I don't know about you, but as I near the getting on the other side of getting closer to the, you know, Kimpy and I was like, wow, do we realize we probably lived over half of our life already? I don't want to mess up. The closer you get to going to heaven and the closer you get to the return of Jesus Christ, I don't want to mess up. So here's, here is um, Samuel, and I love this because he's, he serves God wholeheartedly, but not, not like he used to. 
He's torn because he anointed Saul as the king and felt like he was a son to him. And he watched him slowly walk away and the hand of God start lifting off of Saul. So I want you to look at this in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. I love this. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be king. I love that. Basically, God was saying to him, Samuel, how long are you going to pout because the prayer that you wanted didn't get answered? Samuel, how long are you going to pout because the one you thought should be king isn't the king? How long are you going to pout because I've got my hand on somebody else and not who you think it should be on? And then he says in verse 2, but Samuel said, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Okay, whose viewpoint is that? God's viewpoint or man's viewpoint? Man's. Now, if God tells me to fill my flask with oil and go to somebody's house, that means God's already got somebody picked out. He wants anointed as king. And it means he's going to protect me because he's sending me over there to do it. So immediately, I've got to think, okay, I've got to think God's views, not man's views. And then he says, but Samuel said, how will I do that? And God said, okay. Just take a heifer with you and say that you've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So then he says, for, I love the fact that first of all, when he's mourning, God's saying, listen, you got you to choose mine or yours. Now, what would have happened if Saul had continued to anoint Saul and not done what he told him to do? It would have been havoc around that town in Israel. Amen. He said, so how long are you going to pout? Let's, he knows the future. We're going to see man's views and God's. And then he said, do you not think that God's going to take care of you? So take the heifer and go. And then he says, in verse 4, So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to attend the sacrifice too. Now, I love this. Notice how the people panicked when the prophet came to town. <laughs> Bethlehem's just a little town. Nobody ever goes to. It's full of shepherds in there. Nobody wants to go there. It probably stinks because there's sheep everywhere. And the prophet shows up, and the first thing they think is, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Man, I don't want, you know, it's really funny because when Dr. Ekajuba comes, there's some people that don't come to church because they don't want to see him. Is they avoid him at all costs because they know he's going to be able to read their, their mail. Honey, I want to be right front and center. So if God's got anything he's got to say to me, I want to hear it. Amen? Because I don't want to think I'm on the right path that I'm on the wrong path. You ought to be quick to be wherever he is. Amen? So the people panicked, and it was, it was hilarious because he's like, y'all calm down. I'm just here to offer a sacrifice. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house, and Jesse pulls out all of his sons except one. So Jesse had eight sons. Now, in the natural, what's the worst position to be at if you're a son? Number eight. Because you get all the hand-me-downs, and if you ever lived in a house full of boys, that youngest one is going to get picked on by everybody. I can remember when my kids were, were growing up, and Josh, this is before Caleb became as big as Josh, and they were in the kitchen fighting one, every, one day, and Caleb's on the floor crying, and Kippy goes, just get up and knock him out. And Caleb's like, you don't understand what it's like to have a big brother. And Kippy's like, yes, I do. I had one. But Josh goes away to college, and he came home, and Caleb was as big as he was, and there was no more fighting. <laughs> so it's the same way. I'm sure that David got picked on constantly. But here's the main thing. Jesse did not believe David was his son. So not only is he picked on because he's the youngest, but he's rejected by his father because his father's really not sure that he's his. So everybody else gets trained in the military, everybody else goes to school, and David gets put out in the pasture to mind the sheep. It's a thankless job. And everything that David did out in there, keep, keeping those sheep, every dime he made over keeping those sheep, his father used <clears throat> to educate and train his sons. And when you were in the military then, you did, they didn't feed you. Your family was responsible for bringing you food. So David was not only taking care of the sheep, 
He not only didn't go to school, he only not only didn't get to train in the army, but yet he had to go make those trips back and forth and bring his brothers everything they needed. And they, he got picked on. But God knows things that we don't know. Amen? So, of course, when Jesse goes in there, he goes into the, in there and he lines up all his sons. Now, you know he's going to be just like us. We would do the same thing. If we heard the prophet was coming and one of our kids were going to be chosen, man, we would run and go get him. And, you know, kind of, I have in my mind the picture, like on the sound of music, when the father came back and all the kids were lined up, stair step, and they were performing. Well, I'm sure Jesse did the same thing, man. All seven of them are lined up. The oldest one in the front, fully dressed in his military uniform, looking sharp because God, he knows that that's the one that God's going to choose. He's a captain in the army. He's going to be, you know, he's already fought war. He has, he's a great leader. He's already leading men. Look at verse 6. He said, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But you know what? God has a totally different viewpoint. Amen? Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height for I have rejected him the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them people judge by outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel but Samuel said this is not the one chosen either next Jesse summoned Shimea but Samuel said neither is this the one the Lord has chosen and in the same way all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all, your, all you have? He said, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once. We will not sit down until he arrives. I'm sure by that point, Samuel thought, I've come this far. I've already risked my neck. If Saul hears what I'm doing, I'm already going to be killed, so I might have finished the task that God gave me to finish. I can imagine what Jesse's mind's going through. Surely it's not that one. Do you realize he's been out in the field watching sheep all this long? He probably stinks. It's going to take us forever to give him a bath and make him look presentable. But is it man's viewpoint or God's viewpoint? See, God knows what he's been doing with David all this time. He knows how he's been preparing David. He knows the time David spent out, on the, out in the field all alone, worshiping God, pitting praise and worship to him, singing to him. How many times God has strengthened him to fight a battle that nobody else knew he had fought, victories that he had that nobody else knew he had. And God said, you've got to go out and choose the other one. And I love that. He's the youngest, but God's still watching him. <clears throat> and you know that sheep are dumb. Now, I know that God says that we're shepherds and y'all are sheep, but there's no pun intended that whatsoever, except to listen to this. I love the way he says this. Do you know that sheep don't even know how to back up? They can get pinned in, but because they don't know how to get backed up, they will die right there unless the shepherd comes and pulls them out. Do you realize that sheep, if there's water right there to drink, if, they, if they're not led to that water and it's just five feet away from them, they won't go drink the water? Even if it's the least bit muddy, they won't go do it. They have to have somebody take them to there. We've got to be in the same attitude with God. That we move when he says move and that we do when he says move. Amen? We've got to learn to have God's wisdom and not our own natural wisdom. Now look at um, 1 Samuel 17 verse 33. David's already told Saul, hey, I can fight this, fight this Goliath for you. And then he says in verse 33, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Is that man's viewpoint or God's? That's man's. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from his mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do this to the pagan Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the Lord. It's the first time that somebody from Israel stood up and said, No, he is defying the army of God. He's not in a covenant with God. We are. It's a faith statement. He's got him bold. Amen? So then that makes no sense in the natural that you would let a shepherd boy <coughs> fight. But see, David hadn't told anybody about this. 
He didn't go around bragging about it. It was between him and God and the enemy that he fought. Go back to verse, chapter 16 and look at verse 12. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. And the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Now, we know it wasn't from God, but it, back in the Old Testament, they thought anything that came along with God. They didn't understand demons. Verse 16 said, let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. Then one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a, is a talented harp player. So we know that, that, that David came. He played the harp for, for, um, for Saul, and the tormenting spirits left him. Now, the thing that you need to remember is he could have taken that one success and built a ministry on it. Every minister in the world would be calling him to come to their church and tell how they played the harp, and every demon spirit fled. One success does not make you a minister. Every child of God has the power, the authority, and the ability to drive out any demon spirit. Come on. You have the authority over every situation that the enemy puts in your life. And just because you have success, it's just kind of like I was talking to a lady one time, and um, she was telling me something about her life, and I told her something, and she goes, oh, you're a prophet. I said, no, I'm not. She said, well, you just gave me a prophetic word. I said, no, I gave you something the Holy Spirit said that doesn't make me a prophet. See, just because we flow in the gifts doesn't make us a prophet. It doesn't automatically make me in the fivefold ministry. Every child of God, this, God said the Spirit of God will be inside of you and the gifts of the Spirit will operate in your life. Amen? So we can't look for that. We've got to look for where God wants us to be. And I love that. And so Saul anoints him as his armor bearer. And then immediately after that gets over with, David goes back to being a shepherd. Because he doesn't leave where God has him until God releases him. I love that. He had great leadership potential. Everybody wanted their kid to be an armor bearer right then. Because when you're an armor bearer to the king, as soon as you're, you get too old to carry the armor anymore, you're automatically guaranteed a position either in government or in the military. But David wasn't looking at things in the natural he was looking in things in the spiritual. What did God want him to do? What position did God want him in? Amen? So then he goes back and does that again. I love that. Now here's the crisis. crisis. Chapter 17. We find him facing Goliath. He's nine foot nine inches tall, covered with 180 pounds of armor. They said the tip of his sword weighed 21 pounds. And he's standing up there defying and taunting the children of Israel day after day after day. And one day, David's father sends him to go take food to his brothers. And as he's taking food to his brothers, he hears Goliath taunting them. In, chapter, in verse 26 of chapter 17, it says, David asked the soldier standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Does this sound like a man who remembers his covenant? Yes. It's a faith statement. He remembered the promises of God. And, to all the, and you would have thought at that point that all the army would have rallied for him and said, yes, a man of faith on the scene, one who remembers the covenant with God, one who's going to fight the Goliath and win. But they didn't. Sometimes when you're standing the strongest in faith for something, you're not going to have anybody standing beside you. But you don't need to let that move you. Amen? And then look at verse 28. But when David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Man, I love that. He comes in here and says, what are you doing here? Who do you think you are being here? You are nothing but a little shepherd with just a few little sheep. Isn't that just like a big brother? 
Isn't that just like somebody that you think is going to be on your side and then they just turn and say, you're just full of pride. You think you can be used by God? But I love David. He remembers his covenant. And he doesn't let that bother them. Amen? So he gets reported back to the king. And I love what Saul says. Saul says, okay, that's fine, but you can take my armor. You need to wear my armor. Here's my sword. In other words, if you wear my jersey with my jersey number on it, everybody will think it's me that fought him. And so when they go, they say, look what they did. I can say, yeah, but that was my sword. That was my spear. That was my armor that went out there and fought Goliath. Look at verse 41, 43. 40, no, 41. And I love this. David picks up five stones. You know why he picked up five stones? Because he had four brothers. And he knew if he killed one, there might be more coming. But he was ready. See, sometimes you slay that one demon and four more pop up. But you better be ready to handle every single one of them. Don't you get discouraged because you defeated one and another one comes along. You get ready to fight the next one too. He was prepared to take them all out. So in verse 41 says, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David replied, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Today, come on, say today. today. The Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds of the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled there will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give it to us. And as Goliath moved closer to attack, David waited on him. No. David wasn't on the defense. David become on, became on the offense. And as the enemy came towards him, David ran to him. See, don't back up and let the devil keep coming to you. You better get your sword ready. You better get your stone ready. You better get that word ready. And you better charge full ahead at him. Come on. Remember the Bible says you look at him eyeball to eyeball, face to face, and you tell him where he belongs. You don't back up for the enemy. And then he says in verse... 48, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into the shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword. Woo, I like that. Not only did he defeat the enemy, he got the spoils too, Amen. He said he pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Folks, what is your giant today? Come on, what is your giant? What has been backing you up? What's been staring in your face, keeping you from doing what God's asked you to do? What hurdle is standing before you that seems like a giant that's keeping you from walking in everything that God wants you to walk in? I want you to take a stone, that's the word of God, and I want you to hurl it at that thing and defeat the enemy once and for all. Amen? Come on, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the prayer team comes up, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to come make him your Lord today. Come on, this covenant is open for you. Being a child of God is the greatest adventure you'll ever be on. It is so much fun. And you know somebody's got your back. Come on. So you belong to a family. It's a wonderful place to be. If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, it's a gift for every believer. Do not leave this place without it. But if you say, you know what? I want to be like David, but I just don't know how to be like David. I just need somebody to pray with me today. The altar is open. The rest of you, you better get your stones ready and start hurling them at the enemy and defeat every giant in your life. Amen? Come on. Go ahead. Hallelujah. The altar's open. I can't see what is raging at me. 
Hallelujah. Well, Julius tells me this morning that this is their last Sunday here. They're leaving. Now, he's like a son to me, so I ain't real happy about it. But there's nothing. But you know what? They're ours. You've been here for how many years? Twelve years. So they're moving to Atlanta. So everybody, please stretch for you, your, your hand while we pray over them. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. That, Father, you allowed us time to pour into them. Father, I thank you that they have a covenant with you. Therefore, Father, you will guard their steps. You will direct their path. Father, when they're not listening too well, I thank you that you'll invade their night season so they hear what you have to say. Father, I thank you for your hand of protection. I thank you, Father, that you will bless all that they set their hand to. Now, Father, I know there's gifts and talents that have not been touched. So, Father, I ask that you put them in a place where they will flourish. Father, I thank you that you'll tap into that. You'll put him in a place that recognizes it. And I thank you, Father, that where he is now is not where he'll end up. But, Father, you'll make it even bigger. Now, Father, we put your angels around them. And thank you for your hand upon their life. And, Father, we bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So sweet. So sweet. <laughs> Love, you. Love you, too. God is good. Amen. You know, y'all just let her keep being ministered to. Amen. The rest of you, raise your right hand. Father, in that name of Jesus, we pronounce a blessing over every single person in this place. Father, I thank you today that they will stand as men and women of God in covenant with an almighty God. And, Father, they'll recognize every blessing, every gift, Father, every promise that you ever made. And, Father, I thank you that they'll be bold. Father, they'll pick up the stones and they'll run after the enemy and not back up. Father, I thank you that every word ever spoken over them, Father, will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Father, we're built up today in your word. Father, with boldness, as we leave today, we're going to charge forward, Father. Father, we're going to live the blessed life, and we're going to share you everywhere you, we go, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you all Tuesday night.